Welcome to Soundside and welcome to KUOW's District Dash. I'm Libby Denkman alongside KUOW politics reporter David Hyde. Seven Seattle City Council races will be decided this November, and we've invited all the council candidates to answer the questions voters most want addressed. But we know that you're busy, so we're getting you those answers in 30 minutes. That's why we call it a dash. It does move fast. If a candidate goes over time for an answer, you will hear this. (laughs) Or this. That ferry captain and that seagull are busy voters and they want us to stay on the clock. Today we're headed to District 6. Welcome to the candidates vying to represent neighborhoods including Green Lake, Finney Ridge, Fremont, Ballard, and West Magnolia. Incumbent council member Dan Strauss, welcome to you. Good evening. It's great to be with you. Thank you for having me. Great to have you here. And District 6 challenger, former brew pub owner and current head of the Fremont Chamber of Commerce, Pete Hanning. Hi, Pete. Thanks for being here. Good evening. Glad to be here. So thanks to the candidates, thanks to our audience, and let's get to our first questions. Dan Strauss, let's start with you. The homicide rate is dropping in other major U.S. cities, but not Seattle. 65 homicides so far in 2023. And last week, a shootout near Golden Gardens in your district. One person shot and killed, three others injured. So here's the question from some voters in your district. What specifically have you done in the form of legislation to try and address this spike in violent crime? Yeah, so it was my amendment last year that fully funded the police recruitment plan because we need to be able to hire as many officers as we can. I fully funded the hiring plan as well. And we need to ensure that the officers that we're hiring fit the same values as Seattleites. And that's what we're doing now. Partnering with the North Precinct captain and the North Precinct right now, you'll be seeing more information coming out on the blotter later today. So by the time this airs, it will already be public, but I'm still not going to say what I know just from my private conversations with the police department about what other um, augmentation will be occurring in Ballard uh, to address this. And at the end of the day, Chief Diaz has done a very good job getting guns off the streets. Despite staffing challenges, the Seattle Police Department has gotten more guns off the street under his um, administration than ever before. Great. Uh, Pete Hanning, uh, same topic. You've made hiring more police a big part of your campaign. Mm -hmm. But if you look at some of the studies, it's not exactly clear how much hiring more police does to lower the crime rate. So given that, what would you do specifically to try to address this rise in violent crime? Well, first off, um, I was really affected by last week's shooting. Dan and I were at a forum um, in Magnolia And instead of giving a full two minute introduction, I actually asked for us to take a moment and took the last minute just for a moment of of grace for us all. Because I think we all need to give ourselves a little of that pause and some grace. Um, We really are living in a time where we're we're unsettled. It feels as if um, that we're lilting into maybe vigilanteism and that um, some in the, in the, the criminal element are feeling like they can really get away with stuff. So we do have to be really detailed and dedicated to um, separating those who are most vulnerable and really need our services and those who really need uh, the police presence to stop the behavior. Uh, Just to follow up, staying with you, Pete Hanning, you told KW's uh, that SPD's budget should be significantly um, increased. Is that right? I, yes. Um, why is that? Well, I think that besides staffing, we also need to continue to invest in the tools that public safety really um, needs. Uh, so one of the things I'm really passionate about is taking a look at really incentivizing those officers who have spent years on the force and allowing them to take their police vehicles home. We know a couple things when we allow that to happen. The police officers first take better care of those vehicles, so the the vehicles themselves. They're a really important tool in us helping uh, to stem some of the criminal activity on there. The other thing that I really like is when a police officer makes it into the city limits, regardless of what precinct they work in, they are they're Ah. available for. to take a call right then. So there, the, the dreaded seagull has, has yeah, spoken. Yeah. Um, he had twelve seconds left, though. Oh no! It, it starts to go it up. It starts to oh. count up yeah. once you're oh. over. Dan Strauss, I didn't, 
Uh, same question. Yeah, yeah. Police budget significantly increased. Uh, why? Yeah. And, you know, what's important is that funding doesn't create accountability. We do need more accountability with the police. And there also doesn't need to be this question about are we reducing the police budget or increasing it? And at the same time, I'm not going to come in here and tell the police how they should create their budget, but I'm going to listen to them and and understand what tools they need, whether it's license plate readers or CCTV. I think that that's a smart investment in a lot of ways. But what I'm here to do is be a partner, and the first step in that is listening to what they need. Pete Hanning, this year a judge ended most of the longstanding federal consent decree overseeing the Seattle Police Department, but we still see evidence of serious cultural problems at SPD, such as the recent racist incident involving a mock tombstone at one of the break rooms um, in, uh, in one of the police departments in one of the precincts. What specifically would you do differently to hold SPD more accountable? Hmm. Well, I mean, we need to allow for the police department to also recognize that the reason why we're no longer in the consent decree is because they have made major changes, you know, to the point now where police departments throughout the country actually come to the city of Seattle to see some of the changes that we've made and the new trainings that we have around bias in policing, excessive use of force and using alternative methods. So I think we should also acknowledge that our police department has had made a lot of changes and they need to continue to just like ourselves. We always should be working on getting ourselves better. Um, I was raised by a wild pack of hippies and I was in the East precinct a little before that article came out. That precinct needs a new coat of paint, needs some, some plants in there. It needs a smudge. I mean, it really does have kind of this, like this permeation of sorrow in there. So I think we need to help our police department have a, a more healthy workplace. And I just want to give you a t chance to answer, is there anything you would do to hold the police department more accountable in terms of cultural reforms? Well, I think uh, the, the civilian oversight is where we do that. Um, but we also need to make sure that the police are working under a new contract and they have they have the right to collectively bargain and have a new contract. That's one of the things I have heard consistently from law enforcement is they are feeling like they're not respected because we haven't signed a new contract. OK, thank you. Yeah. Um, Councilmember Strauss, what specifically have you done to fix cultural problems at SPD? And what would you like to say about what you would do in the future if you get a second term? Yeah, so there are a lot of different accountability measures that can be put in place. I currently sit on the Labor Relations Policy Committee that does the negotiations with Seattle Police Officers Guild, the, the Seattle Police Union. And so I need to be a little bit careful about what I'm going to say exactly. But what I can tell you at a high level is that I am absolutely supportive of increasing our officers' pay so that we're competitive with our neighboring jurisdictions and that that contract also needs to have accountability measures in it. There's a list from our accountability partners of different provisions that can make our policing better and safer, and we need to have some of those held within this new contract. Anything specific you want to call out about accountability measures? I want to be careful not to uh, break my cone of silence that is legally required in negotiations. And so, you know, what I can tell you is that there are some really smart measures in there and that we do need to increase accountability while we're also increasing pay. Uh, Pete Hanning, follow up for you. Currently under the police contract, an officer who has been fired for serious misconduct can appeal that decision to a review board and get their job back. Now, that was the case in one infamous incident that happened a few years back where an officer had punched a woman who was handcuffed in the back of a patrol car. He and the union appealed and he was reinstated initially. A judge then overturned that and he did not end up getting his job back. Um, should officers be able to appeal when they've been fired for serious misconduct? Yes, I think we all should have an opportunity for appealing um, incidences like that. And it sounds like the judge, it sounds like the system actually worked and that person wasn't rehired. And so I do think that we should have that opportunity for their police department. 
Same question to you, Councilmember Strauss. I'm going to give you the same answer that my opponent just gave, which is it seems that the process worked in this situation. Yes, everyone should have the right to appeal. What is needs to be looked at is who is making those determinations in the first place. What is the composition of those groups? And at a high level, we really need to have some statewide policy changed that creates an even playing field of accountability bargaining within contracts across the state. So it's not just city by city. All right, taxes and uh, budget. Dan Strauss, mm. sticking with you. Uh, the city, as you know, is forecasting giant budget deficits starting in 2025, over $200 million a year. You and your opponent both told KUW that the city needs to make significant budget cuts to try to address that. But you also said that tax increases are the best way to fill the gap. So why significant cuts plus tax increases? Well, I had to answer the question that was written. I, I so see, yeah. there was a little bit of emphasis put into the question. But the way that I approach this is that we first have to look at what we're spending, how we're spending it. Can we create more efficiencies? Are there programs that are no longer being utilized? Are there programs that, are, that need to be utilized that we're not funding as well? We need to take a top to bottom look and review of how we spend our money in the city in the first place to make sure that we are giving our taxpayers the full worth of their dollar, if not more. And from there, we then have to look at how our revenue is bouncing back. We just got our revenue projections where Jumpstart was up, general fund was up, real estate excise tax was down. This, re this budget hole is still a little uh, a year or two off, and 80% of it or more is labor contracts. And it's because labor contracts have been pushed off for the last number of years. We need to make sure that we pro continue providing services for our city. We pay our workers a living wage. And at that point, if there's still a budget hole, that's when we need to look at taxes. Uh, Pete Hanning, question for you. Um, you said no to tax increases to deal with this budget deficit. Why no? Well, because I think at f uh, first and foremost, we need to do a full audit and really see where the money is coming from. And a budget really is reflective of the council and where they put their resources. And you guys have overspent. And that's why we're in looking at a hole in a couple of years. And I do think that there is a time and place where we can go back to the citizenry and say, hey, we need some more funds for these particular issues. But I am concerned that right now we haven't shown them that we're spending those resources that we are currently bringing in wisely. And so I, I would definitely uh, be very hesitant to ask for any new tax increases. And this is a follow-up along those same lines. The city, as you know, has a tax on big business called the Jumpstart Tax. Mm -hmm. You're the only candidate out of 14 who told KUW you'd consider a moratorium on that tax. So given what we're facing in terms of budget deficits, um, why is that a good idea? Well, because I think that business is our community as well. And for too long, we have been villainizing business, both big and small. And a lot of times we only think that we're going after big business, but it's really all the small businesses get swept up as well. And so, you know, as someone who owned their own business for 20 years, as someone who's the executive director of a small neighborhood chamber, I feel very strongly that I want to protect those businesses that are so important to the character and the uh, vibrancy of our communities. So the Jumpstart tax is a tax on big business, though, correct? Uh, some big businesses and some middle tier businesses. Dan Strauss, you're a big supporter of the Jumpstart tax. I help co-sponsor it. Uh, and, a, and a help co-sponsor it. Would you vote to expand the number of companies who would potentially have to pay the Jumpstart tax heading into the future to help deal with um, some of these budget deficits. Yeah, the Jumpstart tax was actually the first tax passed at the city that didn't put the burden on property tax or sales tax. So on everyday people in Seattle, this is the first, time, first tax that was passed that wasn't on the backs of everyday people. And that's why I co-sponsored it. And it's also important that the, the answer is yes to your question, but only after we go through the exercises of looking at how we're spending our money right now, looking at how revenue projections are coming in in the next couple of years, and then understanding what that hole is at the end of the day. We have to take a quick break. You are listening to Soundside. We'll be back in a couple of minutes with Seattle City Council District 6 candidates Dan Strauss and Pete Hanning. Stay with us on KUOW. And oh my gosh, we're back. 
Welcome back to Soundside and our KUOW District Dash. Today, we're talking about the future of Green Lake, Finney Ridge, Fremont, Ballard, and West Magnolia with Seattle City Council District 6 candidates, Pete Hanning and current City Council member Dan Strauss. Now, we've been running through a lot of really serious questions here. Time to have a little bit of a palate cleanser. Uh, first to you, Dan Strauss, if you have a free afternoon, I know it's hard to imagine during a campaign, but if you have a free afternoon in District 6, open up. What is your favorite way to spend it? 15 seconds. Walking around Green Lake, walking through Discovery Park, paddling my kayak off the Ballard Elks Lodge, or if it's Sunday, walking through the Sunday market. Nice. Pete Hanning. Well, which Sunday market, Dan? Because there's two. There's the Fremont Sunday market and the Ballard <laughs> Farmer's and Market. And words. I like I mean, them both. Like, okay. Well, <laughs> as someone who worked for both, you know, I just want to make sure I knew. Uh, so for me, uh, I'm a runner. Um, so my happy place is out on the trails. Um, Discovery Park would probably be the place I've spent the most amount of hours and miles. Uh, my favorite route would be to go along uh, the north side of the Ship Canal, cross the Ballard Locks, go underneath the Heron Rookery, up into uh, Wolf, uh, Wolf Tree Trail, then go down to the Lighthouse, come back up, uh, maybe come across the Fremont Bridge. It's a nice long run. All right. Uh, let's get to another really important topic, top of mind for most voters, homelessness. Pete Hanning, voters want to know how you and your opponent differ on this really important issue. So let's talk about the large encampment along Leary Way in Ballard around mm -hmm. 14th Avenue. Uh, the mayor's office said outreach started in August to try to get people living in tents and RVs there connected to services. Now SDOT has posted a notice saying that the area will be cleared starting on Thursday. Um, at least two dozen people are still living there. Someone uh, that our reporter Casey Martin uh, posted a photo of has pumpkins out for Halloween. I mean, they're pretty, you know, uh, a set in there in the, the spot where they're living. So my question to you is, is it okay that it took more than two months for this clearance to occur? And if you were on the council, would you have changed anything about how the city approached this? Well, let's be clear. It's not been two months. It's been at least two years. I mean, that encampment has been in Leary for longer than that. And two so, months since what the mayor said was the start of outreach. Okay. Um, no, that's not fast enough. We need to be uh, laser focused on doing outreach to those who need it. And also at the same time, as we started our conversation today, talking about public safety, going after those who are preying upon our most vulnerable. At the same time, we really need to start looking at what are the tools that are going to really get people to accept some of these services that we're trying to do. Um, and that might mean required participation in some of these services, whether it's addiction help, uh, mental health help, you know, we need to allow for um, them to get into the system because if not, we're just squeezing the balloon and that's not adequate. Council Member Strauss, again, is two months uh, OK from the start of outreach to when the sweep is happening? And there are two dozen people approximately who will be uh, moved uh, at the end of this week. Our reporter Casey Martin says that he's spoken to some people there. One woman said that she was going to get into a tiny home, but many people say they're just going to move to another block. Um, what do you think about how this has gone down? And um, do you think that two months of outreach and then a sweep is appropriate? So I've been helping to lead this work. So I think that the work that we're doing there is the right way of doing business. This approach is modeled after the Ballard Commons and Woodland Park resolutions that ended without sweeps. And so what we have to do is create a census. We then do a needs assessment. We start placing people into shelter, and then we do a surge at the end. Because Leary has so many blocks involved, we're doing it block by block. And so there was actually a resolution at a block last week on 11th between 46th and Ballard Way that I guess the media didn't catch on to, mm -hmm. um, where four out of five people went into tiny homes. It, of the 22 people that are on Leary between 14th and 15th, we have 10 that are scheduled to go into the highest level shelters that comes with chemical, you know, substance abuse and mental health counseling. We placed four into tiny homes last week, and we are making the plans for the remaining eight, and we have a couple different shelter types open so that people don't get pushed down the street. They get to come inside. And just a really quick um, 15 seconds to you, is that timeline about what it 
takes. I mean, is that an appropriate timeline, two months of outreach and then a sweep um, for future projects? Yeah, so Ballard Commons took five months. Woodland Park took five months. There are, t- there are four phases. There's the, needs, this, the census, phase one. Second is the needs assessment. Third is play, drawdown and placement, and fourth is the surge at the end. We're seeing the surge at the end right now in Leary between 14th and 15th. So the first two phases, that time is dependent upon the amount of time that it takes the outreach workers to do that work. The second two phases, three and four, that time is dependent upon shelter availability coming on online. And so I'm sorry I'm ignoring your bagel because this is an important answer because, you know, phase three we can move as quickly as we have shelter available. During that time, we have to expand shelter availability so that we can go into phase four with that surge at the end. Pete Hanning, I heard you say that this didn't happen quickly enough, that it was years before the city uh, took action. How would you do it differently? Well, I think that there's a, a, a component here that's missing in this conversation. It is the community and those businesses that have been under siege and and harmed for years. So whether it's two, you know, whether we're saying the mayor's two months or you're going off my two years, it has been a long time. And we have to recognize that there is just a level of frustration. And we are not seeing that anything really changes along that corridor. All we see is that people move from block front to block front. So I, I hope that you're right, Dan, but I'm very skeptical. Final 30 seconds to you, Councilmember Strauss, just to respond to that. Yeah, so we addressed the Ballard Commons without a sweep, and we have removed homeless encampments west of 15th without sweeps, and we've seen a change. We've done the same north end of the industrial district there, and in June there were still about 30 people that were camped moving block to block. In July, we saw a surge of people. We began our our drawdown in August, much like at Woodland Park, where we started with 60 people and ended with getting 89 people inside. We saw more people come in in September. And this is the way, this is the program that will create a lasting change. All right, Dan Strauss, staying with you, a new category uh, we're calling Your Politics. Um, You won in 2019 with significant backing from progressive groups. You told KUW that you voted for the more progressive mayoral candidate in 2021. That was City Council President Lorena Gonzalez. But you also said if you had a time machine, you'd go back and change your vote to the more moderate candidate, Mayor Bruce Harrell. And this year, an independent PAC led by real estate and other business interests is backing your campaign. So not directly, but, you know, through an independent PAC. Can you please explain your political evolution over the last two years that would make you now regret your vote for Lorena Gonzalez? It's not anything about former Council President Lorena Gonzalez. It's about how impressed I've been with Mayor Bruce Harrell. Mayor Bruce Harrell has made really smart hiring choices. He listens to the people that he hires, even if he might not agree with them at first. And he does a really good job of delegating and leading our city, getting us off the... I've, and I, my office partners with the mayor's office on so many things. And... We've partnered really hard to get our city off the wrong track and on the right track. And when we have discussions, it's we're both clear-eyed. We cannot afford to lose any momentum. We cannot afford to lose any ground. And so, you know, I'm the same guy that I that ran in 2019. And I don't know what more to say. You know, I'm I'm just very impressed with how Mayor Bruce Harrell has run his office and has made some really positive changes for our city. Pete Hanning, 30 seconds if you want it. Well, I th- um, I think Dan has made a change of heart, and uh, we have all seen it. We've seen it with where the money's coming in. Um, you know, he's trying to get credit for what he's done with the police department recently, but you don't get credit for a couple shovels back into the ditch that you are also accountable of. We're 400 officers down. And so, like, this flip-flopping has not done our city really good. 30 seconds. Yeah, in 2020, I said that we have to define how cuts occur to the police department because I did not believe that blunt cuts were the answer that some of my council colleagues thought were the answer. In 2020, I said that we have to scale up alternatives before we scale down the police and that it's important that we, uh, let me say this another way, I also voted against hiring freezes because I knew that we needed to continue hiring. I voted for hiring bonuses. I've, uh, it was my amendment that made the council's budget come into 99% alignment with Mayor Harrell's SPD investments. 
the work is there. You can check the work. All right, moving on. Pete Hanning, a uh, question about your political values. You're head of the yep. Fremont Chamber of Commerce. Yeah. You've raised concerns about the jumpstart, a progressive tax on big business, but you told KUW congestion pricing, tolling busy city roads, which is a regressive tax, is something that you're interested in. So why yes to a regressive tax, but no to or reluctance about a progressive tax on big business? Well, I think that um, actually that is a way to encourage um, our streetways to be used for the best service, which is the movement of people through mass transit and also freight. You know, I'm a big proponent of freight, and the reason is those are goods and services, those are jobs, and so we want to do everything we can to ensure that our freight can move as easily through our city as possible. Dan, 30 seconds on taxes if you want to respond. You know, I have some concerns with congestion pricing only because it, without taking into consideration working families and the workers who can't necessarily rely on transit because they have to get there very early or very late or they have to bring their tools, you know, there's some concerns there. But should we be venturing towards a place where we're not relying on our cars to get downtown? Yes, absolutely. And yes, we need to have freight be able to move freely throughout our city because, you know, it's my ideal to have a 15-minute city where you can walk 15 minutes to get everything you need. But to do that, you have to rely on freight. Pete Hanning, many of Seattle's small businesses have struggled since the pandemic. You are an experienced small business owner, but you've never served as an elected official. Correct. What specific things would you do differently if elected to help small businesses stay afloat? And these are hopefully things that aren't already being done. What are your new ideas? Well, I think the number one thing that I hear from the small businesses that I currently uh, represent is they want a city that is responsive. Um, you know, they are feeling as if no one is listening to them, no one's coming out, um, whether it is actions in front of their storeway, people coming into their storefronts in crisis. Um, we need a city that's actually doing the basics. And the first thing in our charter is public safety. And we're not living up to that right now. And until we can start doing those basics well, we shouldn't be moving on to some of the, the bigger, bigger ideas. Dan Strauss, same topic. What have you specifically done in your time on the council in the form of legislation to help small businesses in District 6 thrive? And what more is there to be done? Yeah, it was my bills that created the outdoor dining, which helped save a lot of small businesses throughout our city. But you know, it's not just legislation. For me, it's implementation. A good policy not implemented doesn't work. And so I focus a lot of my time on that. Uh, I have funded in the Ballard Alliance hired a public safety coordinator in this budget session tomorrow. So I don't know when this airs, but since previously, I have a budget amendment that will put a team of ambassadors under that public safety coordinator, and they do the work of interacting with small businesses and the departments that can meet their needs. This is an expansion of the public safety task force that I, I run a number of these task forces throughout the district that connect the small businesses, residents, and the departments that can meet their need. And I do this by having a district six district director be a dispatcher and a coordinator for all of these different people. I have a district office at the Ballard Library. I'm the only council member with a district office so that I can stay close and connected to these small businesses. It's our lightning round. That's lightning what it means. Round. It's the lightning round. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, let's start with Dan Strauss. We'll kind of go Dan, Pete Hanning for these ones. Uh, so these are, these are one word answers. Seattle's forecasting big budget deficits, as we mentioned, starting in 2025. A work group recently suggested new taxes to fill the gap. So yes or no, would you be likely to support a high pay CEO ratio tax? Dan Maybe. Strauss. Maybe. No. A city level capital gains tax. Yes. No. A city inheritance tax. Maybe. Maybe. A tax on vacant property. Yes. Yes. All right. Moving on from taxes. This is a either or. Fremont Troll. Or Lenin statue? Troll. Troll. Follow up, should the Lenin statue be torn down? No. No. Uh, Ballard Ave or Finney Ave? Ballard. Ballard Ave. Two for Ballard Ave. Okay, here's um, a... Can we put, keep the pumpkin on Lenin's head? 
<laughs> it's uh, Jack O'Lennon, and Sorry. the artist's name is Daniel Blackjar Follies. <laughs> He's a fabulous artist. Anyone can look him up. Uh, all right. They're, they're breaking the rules. What are we? All right. Here's a sports question. Rain or storm? Dan Strauss. Storm. Pete Hanning? Storm. One more sports question. Sonics or Kraken? Oh, Dan Strauss. Bal Ballard FC. Uh, so you, you, you anticipated my next question, so uh, let's do Let's redo that one. Sonics or Kraken? Dan Strauss. This is the first time you've stumped me this entire This could session. be what the whole election hinges on, so. Yeah. Mm. Both. I know. Oh, Sonics all the way. All right. One more sports question. Seattle Sounders or Ballard FC? Ballard FC. I got to go Sounders, the original Sounders. I got to see them play Pele in the kingdom. This is so. one word, one word here. USL uh, days. Follow up yeah. to that. Should any U.S. soccer team be called a football club? Yes or no? <laughs> yes. Yes. That's, that's the incorrect answer. Last question. <laughs> You've got three choices here. The locks, the lock spot, or lock and keel? All three. I mean, I'm going to go with the Ballard locks. It's one of my favorite places in the world. All right, so let's get to the candidate closing statements here. One minute to each candidate. We flipped a coin ahead of time. And Pete Hanning, you go first. One minute for your closing Great. statement. Well, uh, when I started this journey, I really wanted to make sure that I was receptive to hearing what people wanted to talk about. The major things we're hearing, not surprisingly, is around public safety, homelessness, housing, uh, and the environment. And it has been such a gift and such a journey. Uh, I knew it was going to be hard, but it's been harder than I thought. And I'm really thankful for that because this job is really hard. And so I do appreciate the work you've done, Dan. But I do think that I bring a skill set and some experiences that are different than Dan and really are needed on the council. And so come November 7th, I really hope that the, the citizens of D6 vote for Pete Hanning. Councilmember Strauss, you get the last word. Thank you. I'm Councilmember Dan Strauss representing you in District 6. I work from my district office at the Ballard Library half-time and my city hall office half-time because I don't think that you should have to go out of your way to have your voice heard by city hall. My office focuses on three top priorities, and that's addressing public safety, addressing homelessness, and creating the housing that is affordable for working families because the family that I grew up in should be able to afford to live in the Seattle of today and tomorrow. Things are better today than they've been in the last few years, but better's not good enough, and that's why I'm running. I want to raise my kids in a neighborhood that is safer than the one that I grew up in. Growing up in District 6, I see the horizon. It has a brighter future than what we have today as long as we don't let up. I've dedicated my life to public service, I've navigated hard times, and I've delivered for our district and city by bringing people together to find common ground. I'm endorsed by Mayor Bruce Harrell. I'm the only incumbent endorsed by Mayor Bruce Harrell. I'm endorsed by unions and community organizations and many elected officials. I ask for your support to keep the momentum and to continue working for you. Thank you to Dan Strauss and Pete Hanning, your candidates for District 6 on the Seattle City Council. You can hear all of our District Dashes on the Soundside podcast and look for David Hyde's reporting on KUOW.org. For David Hyde, I'm Libby Denkman. Happy voting, everybody. Happy voting. <laughs>